Amen. You may be seated. Today we'll open to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, and we'll follow the lectionary readings. And this brings us to chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. Before we read our text, let's, let us go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his guidance. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for this word that has been preserved by your spirit so that we might return to it weekly to be fed and nourished. And Lord, we ask that as we read that uh, this word would be driven into our hearts, Lord. We ask that uh, we would work it out in our lives, so that you might receive honor and glory. And we do pray this now by faith, in the name of Jesus, who teaches us. Amen. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And still others claimed. He is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and the military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask for me anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths, his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it, we say, Amen. First thing to consider, Like father, like son. Now, what do you know? Surprise, surprise. Uh, what do we find here within the political sphere, the political atmosphere of Jesus' day? Do you find a ruler um, who behaves himself, uh, who behaves himself, loves the law of God, studies it day and night, seeks to reward the righteous, punish the evil? Um, do you see the high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee checking and balancing Herod's rule to make sure that it's in line with God's word. Uh, no, not at all. Um, you find corrupt rulers govern, governed by their appetites 
pun intended, I guess, and pride. Um, now, there are a lot of Herods mentioned in the New Testament, and it's easy to get them confused. But the Herod that the text mentions here is the one, uh, one of the sons of Herod the Great. So uh, let's just take a moment to get some background there. Herod the Great, remember, is the Herod who was ruling in Judea when Jesus was born. He was appointed to be a vassal king of the Roman Empire from 37 to 4 BC. Uh, Sproul noted that upon his, that, that's Herod the Great's death, his kingdom was divided into four parts and given to his four sons, each of whom became a tetrarch, meaning ruler of a fourth. So one area divided in four. Herod Antipas, who became Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, was the Herod who is mentioned in Luke's account of Jesus' passion in chapter 23, verses 6 through 12. Thus, members of Herod, Herod's family appear in Scripture at both the beginning and the end of Jesus' life. But Herod Antipas is also mentioned in Mark 6. So this is the Herod we're talking about here. Um, one of the sons of Herod the Great. And so this is given to us in this gospel narrative. Mark breaks away from his narrative of Jesus' work, his healings, his work, um, to recount the fate of John the Baptist. So for a little family history again, how were the Herods as rulers? Well, I, pres I presume you've heard this idiom, right? Like father, like son. Well, this very much applies to Herod the Great and his sons after him. Was it a good thing, that fa like father, like son, in this circumstance? Well, it's been noted that Herod the Great, like most rulers of the day, he was ruthless, murdering his wife, his three sons, this is three of his sons, mother-in-law, brother-in-law, uncle, and many others, not to mention the babies in Bethlehem. When Jesus was born, remember, he lying in order to try to prevent competition to the throne. And so you remember the story of the Magi's visit uh, recorded in Matthew's Gospel where the young boys uh, were put to death. The, the newborn children there uh, were put to death in order to prevent any takeover of the throne. So he was uh, a man who was wicked. He was fearful and he ruled in a very tyrannical way. It's also true that this Herod the Great accomplished many great building projects, including the rebuilding of the Second Temple that stood during Jesus' ministry. But again, he was a corrupt ruler. Basically, he went mad. It was crazy. Now, his son Herod Antipas, who we read about in our text today, he learned his father's ways, and he himself was bent on evil. Jesus actually refers to him in Luke 13, 32 as a fox. This was an insult and a reference to an unclean animal. Um, this Herod Antipas was actually a puppet king, and again, not a Jew in the physical sense. He was actually an Edomite descendant of the Edomite lineage, and nor could it be said that he was a true spiritual Jew inwardly, to use a Pauline language. Um, this, again, we, we learn from this very graphic and narrative, uh, graphic and tragic narrative in Mark's Gospel. Herod Antipas was very much like his father. He learned his father's ways, and he fell into very similar sins um, like his father. So here's an application for us before we move on. Like father, like son. This is one of those inescapable realities of life. And I'm speaking particularly to you fathers. You may have heard it said that a father is always teaching. And this is true. Fathers teach their children. It's an inescapable aspect of the way God made the world. It's not whether a father will teach his children, his sons or daughters. It's a matter of what is being taught that must be acknowledged, must be taken into account. In a broken home, for example, um, where a father is absent due to some sin, uh, whatever it might be, he's out of the picture in some way or another, 
It's also been said that a father's empty seat at the dinner table speaks volumes to his children. A father, whether he is present or not, is always saying something. But it should also be noted that mere physical presence is not enough either. A father may be in the chair at every supper time meal. He might be physically around, but spiritually absent, emotionally absent. He doesn't say a word. He's passive. He doesn't lead his home. He doesn't encourage. He doesn't correct sin in the house. Physical presence is also not enough, but even if one is physically present but spiritually absent, you might say again, instruction is still occurring. Fathers are always instructing. So fathers, you are assigned a role by the Lord God. Be a faithful head. You are charged by God to raise up your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. See to it that this is the case. Be an example in all matters of life especially in the way you love your wife, you treat your wife, especially the way you work, your attitude, be attentive to the word of God and the spirit that you bring when you enter the home. All of these things will be instructive to your children and it will shape the way they live out their days. Honor the law of God, love it, live it from your heart. Teach your kids not to just uh, Obey God's word as if it's some list to check off, but to love it, to cherish the word, to love, to, to love obedience to God. And they learn it as they see you genuinely going to the word for instruction and having it as a guide for your life. You know, this is again one of the chief ways by which God reforms culture and societies through families, beginning with heads of families. Families are being reformed and led by God-fearing husbands and fathers, and that's the way that God often does a renewing work in a disintegrating culture, an apostate culture. Secondly, uh, let's look at this, the neck that turns the head. You've heard this as well, right? Anyone heard this? The neck that turns the head? Okay, uh, it's a popular metaphor used to describe this dynamic between husbands and wives. And in our modern times, these words speaking, uh, spoken excuse me, by uh, Naya Verdalo's mother in my big fat Greek wedding. Uh, when she was giving uh, instruction to her daughter, she said, the man is the head, but the woman is the neck, and she can turn the head any way she wants. Now, we, we've seen here in this text in Mark how corrupt the Herod family had become. Yes, he was bothered. It, it, we can pick up on this, that Herod was bothered in his conscience. He was, he, he was in some way convicted by what John the Baptist had said. He had a conscience. Everyone has a conscience. God built this into image bearers. But the conscience can become calloused as a result of ongoing sin. And if it's left to itself... If allowed to rule a man apart from God's word, the conscience will make excuses to sin and justify unrighteousness. Now, in the text, you heard that Herod, disturbed by an uneasy conscience and one who was prone, he was one uh, who, who was also prone to superstition. Uh, he feared that John had come back from the dead. When he heard about what was going on, the miracles were, that were being performed, this is, he was stricken and he was in, in being somewhat superstitious. Knowing what had happened to John and what he was responsible for, he, he was fearing that John came back from the dead and he was going to come get him. Uh, so, we have here in the account, it's like a movie, we have, there's a flashback. Uh, back to Herod's birthday party. And this is a party you'll never forget. Here was a man who, because of his lack of self-control, he was, he fell prey to this horrific sin, um, murdering John the Baptist, seeing to, to it that John was killed. 
one who he had developed a relationship with, and to some extent, again, he was convicted by John's teaching, but he was still ruled and mastered by evil, and it showed, it showed uh, in his politics and in his relationships. The text said that John the Baptist called Herod out of his adulterous affair and illegitimate marriage according to the law of God. So John went with the law of God and confronted Herod, calling him on his sin. This Herod had, again, an adulterous affair and then entered into an illegitimate marriage. Herodias, Herod's wife, nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. But again, Herod's sinful tendencies and weaknesses got the best of him. He was a man given to sinful pleasures of life and one who fell prey to the sin of seeking approval from men rather than God. And his wife became the neck that turned his head to the head of John the Baptist. Remember that his wife, through trickery, waited for just the right moment to use her influence, to make her request, which was a murderous one. Herod, having made a foolish vow at his birthday party, likely given over to the drinks and all that come along with it, having been seduced by Herodias' daughter, don't think innocent of this dance, my taking place before the high officials and the military commanders this is their political this is what they're doing right behind closed doors in some respect this is what they were up to but high officials were present military commanders and leading men he made this vow what did he do he he preferred to save face before these men rather than humble himself before god and deal with the consequences that would follow. He was put on the spot, and he acted foolishly in his pride. And his wife Herodias, again, she was also here acting the part of sin. She hated, hated being called out for her evil behavior by John, and she nursed a grudge against him. So again, there's... Men, women, they have tendencies towards sin, all subject to sin, mankind as a people, all totally depraved. So Herod's sinning, Herodias is sinning, each in different ways, um, but very much related. Because John called her out on their unlawful relationship, she nursed a, dr a grudge against him. She was too prideful to repent. She wanted John's head on a platter. Having been participant in adultery with Herod, she also taught, so not only do we have like father, like son, but think like mother, like daughter. There is behavior that's learned here from mom to daughter. Um, Herodias, having been participant in a sexually immoral relationship, adultery with Herod, she, by this type of behavior, surely was showing her daughter the ways of unchaste behavior expressed through sexual pro promiscuity and modesty. Uh, and those are the, you can get what you want if you use your power this way, in other words. As a woman, you can manipulate and get what you want using this kind of deviant behavior. This is, this is something that, again, very much would be like mother, like daughter. And so Herodias' daughter knew how to get the attention from these men in this room, and she used it to her political, albeit corrupt, advantage. And so, like mother, like daughter, and Herod caved upon the request. And Herodias, again on this occasion, became the neck that turned the king's head against John so that John's head would be presented on a platter. So application, again, another one, very practical. But men, marry well. Marry well in the Lord. Uh, wives, set godly examples. Mothers, set godly examples for your daughters that they might imitate your ways. Use your gifts of gifts of information management, relationships, for good, not for evil. Use them for good, not for evil. Herodias managed information in this 
way that you might say it was evil, but in some ways it required a lot of thought and planning to, to work this according to the timing that she saw fit. Herodias managed this kind of information in these relationships, but she used it for evil, not good. So, ladies, cultivate an inward, godly, gentle spirit. Mothers, wives, as it says in 1 Peter 3, use your creational gift of feminine beauty, which God has made and put in you. Use it to attract and accomplish righteousness in keeping with God's commands. Um, and, you know, it's said that oftentimes for, for women, when they're modest, they attract the wrong kind of man. So it's not the kind of husband that you want. So in your modesty and in your work and growing and creating inward, meaning true, genuine faithfulness to the Lord and to the role that you have been called, develop that and see to it and pray that God will reward you accordingly. So Herodias and her daughter were more like Lady Folly in the Proverbs. So if you read the Proverbs, think about all the tactics that Lady Folly is said to use in order to bring about evil and to cause the man of folly to trip into her home and see to it that his life falls apart. Herodias and her daughter were more like the Lady Folly in Proverbs. They were the neck that turned the king's head toward evil, not good. So be a righteous neck, <laughs> not a stiff neck, lady. Be like Lady Wisdom. Be a woman of wisdom. Read the Proverbs about Lady Wisdom. A godly wife, what is she like? The Proverbs in chapter 33, it says, A godly wife who can find she is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. And it says in the same chapter, she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. And then it says charm later in this chapter is deceptive. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. All right, let's just conclude here. The last point would be the body of Christ for today, the body of Christ. So Mark's gospel places this story, um, John's beheading, strategically within his gospel overall, within the narrative. The first audience you should keep in mind of this gospel, some have noted that this likely would have been to those um, uh, who were suffering, again, from persecution, from evil rulers. And even some have noted this to be persecution that had taken place under the emperor Nero. So think about you as one who would be a recipient of this gospel, who is facing hiding, having to meet in hiding, um, literally in fear of your life being taken. This kind of account in the gospel would be that which would spur you on to persevere into faithfulness, even if it meant you'd have to suffer to the point of death. This story of John's beheading is a signal of what was to come for those who follow Jesus. But don't forget, just prior to the story of John being put to death, Jesus raised the synagogue ruler's daughter from the dead. And that story was a foreshadowing of the greater resurrection in Jesus Christ that was to come at the end of the gospel. Jesus is the one who has power over death, over sin, and can raise the dead to new life. If Jesus, the head of the church, has been raised up on high, and as it says in Ephesians, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but in the age to come. God, having put all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, who is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way, as the Apostle Paul said in the letter to Ephesians, if this be true, and it is, then we shouldn't fear opposition from the authorities. As God's people, we can hear this word, we can hear this gospel, and we can receive the encouragement that we need, knowing that Jesus has power over death itself. The secularism of our age is one that is tyrannical, it's status, it's atheistic, but above all, it's anti-Christian. It's anti-Christian explicitly. But remember the true head Christ and the body as the church who is called to persevere. That is you. That is you. In the face of 
tyrannical authorities who are given over to the sinful ways of this world and who are mastered by it. You might face pushback, yes, for being a godly family, for applying these truths, being faithful fathers, mothers, wives, family members, children, sons, daughters. But remember that godly households and godly churches worship, worshiping Jesus faithfully, this was the vehicle for reformation in the early church. Life in Jesus is what turns dead fathers into living fathers, dead mothers into living mothers, dead families and children into living ones, even in the face of persecution. He's the one who came to die for stiff-necked sinners so that through faith and repentance, sinners can become a new man and him be brought to new life. And he was living in perfect accord with his father. That which the Son did, this was representative of the Father's will. In perfect harmony, he lived out this relationship in his life to the point where he was obedient even unto death so that we might have forgiveness of sins, putting our faith in him, and being a people who are called to repentance, to real change. When we hear the word of God and it touches home, Thank God for it. Embrace it. Love it. Thank the Lord that he's bringing the law of God to bear upon you so that you might be moved from sin to be drawn near to him in Christ's likeness. Union by faith and union in him, you will have strength to overcome. One of the devil's leading tactics, tactics uh, to try to undermine Christianity, again, is to attack the family by slandering it, by undermining it, by undermining fatherhood by undermining what it means to be a mother. Um, again, and if you can cut off the head of the family, if you can lead a culture to hate Christian fathers, then that's a way in to undermine the whole society. Families fall apart, culture falls apart, it leads to much chaos, and then the state tries to step in and play God. And again, even this past week, I think that it's appropriate to say, look, our nation is fatherless. We are desperate for someone who will be the godly man who has courage and will, who, who will stand for truth. We're so desperate. And many people are attracted, attracted to just that character. And so it's a fight for a father in our nation right now. Who's going to be the father who will take the stand? But again, this is in desperation because of the state of our society as a whole. Because in our local levels, in our local contexts, families have been weakened. And so the church, in correlation with families, need to be strengthened. And from there, reformation will begin. So listen. Uh, Jesus came to raise households and fathers and mothers back to life. He's the one who conquered death. Um, as, as it says in Romans, Paul wrote to the church at Romans, said basically the political powers that be, the corrupt religious rulers of the day, uh, he said the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And it came to pass. Rome fell. It, it, Rome fell. And it was the blood of the martyrs that acted as that seed of the early church. That over the course of time, two, three hundred years, it came to be that Rome fell. And the empire itself became Christian. For what, for what it's worth, Christianity uh, 1.0 needs improvement. We're hoping for the next better improved version to come about in the course of Western history. But it took time for that to work itself out. But this is why Paul would preach things like to Ephesus here in their context, and he would explain how Jesus is the head. He is the ruler above all. He has been given all authority, and God has worked power through him, through him being crucified and then being risen from the dead. He is Lord. He is king over all. And then he says, husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Fathers, raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That was Rome's undoing. It was a matter of time, patience, faith, trust, going back to the Word, the 
day in day routine, day in day out routines of just being faithful where you are and trusting that the Lord will work on the big narrative. He will bring about the glory that is due to the name of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The enemies of God will not be victorious. So let's rejoice in the Savior who has come, who is the head, the head of his church, and who sees to it that his people are brought to new life, beginning with one family at a time. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us as we consider this word to stay loyal to God as this public sphere around us shows him no allegiance. Help us, even in the face of great wickedness, to be willing to suffer for the truth. Prepare, prepare us, Lord, whatever that might look like. Uh, help us to be uh, a people who not just recite these stories and think nice of them, but Lord, we pray that they would be at work in our hearts so that we would be a prepared to, to, to love and to serve one another as you have called us to do so, even in the face of persecution, and we pray for your blessing and be added to it now in Jesus' name, amen.